uh, put our hands together for Pastor Ross Abraham. Thanks, mate. Ah, <laughs> uh, Alan. You need your glasses. Yes, you do. You need your glasses. Hey, it's great to see you all. Thank you for having Kathy and I here for your ninth celebration. Every time I come here, all you guys do is eat. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, yeah, yeah. I mean, food. Yeah. I, I first went to church because I was keen on the song leader, who was Kathy. <laughs> So uh, up in Townsville, her father pastored a uniting church, and I thought, oh, I'm going to rock up because she's a, a hottie, I, whom I met at a nightclub, get that into your theology, and uh, went to church and gave my heart to Christ there, and uh, that was when I was 19 years of age. And so, you know, when guys say, I'm only here for the girls, I go, whatever it takes to, to get you to hear the gospel, the good news, and if it's food, Fantastic. So it's great to be with you. I want to share this morning something that uh, I, I think it's become a bit of a, not a life message, but certainly something that is percolating in me for the church in this time, 2024. Let me read to you. I've titled this, this message, Why Not Now? Why Not Now? Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2. Habakkuk is in the Old Testament, one of the smaller, the, called the minor prophets, and it says this, I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing works. In this time of our deep need, who reckons we've got deep need right now? In this time of our deep need, help us again as you did in years gone by. And in your anger, remember your mercy. In this time of our deep need, help us again as you did years gone by. If there was a cry that I believe God would want to stir again in the church, it's for the people of God to begin to cry out again and say, God, we're living in pretty desperate times. We need you to move upon us and upon our society in the way that you once moved in our past. I am, I, I am a big reader. I love to read, love to um, uh, research stuff and have quite a passion in the area of revivals and, and things that have gone past and love reading about them and discovering the, the ingredients that have caused God to pour out of his, his spirit in some of the most unusual places all around the world. And there is one constant that you always look at and that you always discover in every move of God has never taken place without the church praying. And the church gathering to prayer. And I said to the guys last night, prayer is a, a hard discipline to build. And our emotions are really poor leaders in the space of prayer. If it's left up to our emotions, we're, we're never going to pray because we never feel like it. But there's something about a people, and I am praying this morning that those people would be found here in Arise Church, the church on the hill, that people would refer to this place as a praying church. A church that when you pray, something can be seen from the rest of the surrounding district, maybe a little flicker or a fire on top of this building as the people of God gather to pray and believe as Habakkuk prophesied, God, in this time of our deep need, in this time of the depression, the, the depression across our nation, of the perverseness across our nation, of the confusion across our nation, and this time of our deep need, help us again as you did in years gone by. Do you realize in 1993, this movement of churches, INC, was touched by God in such a radical way that when Kathy and I were on staff at what is now called City Point Church, used to, used to be called Mansfield COC, that the Spirit of God poured out, and for an extended period of time, we have a school, a P uh, uh, Peter 12 school on the property for an extended period of time that school was shut down because the spirit of God had fallen upon the students and teachers would get up to teach and children were laying in the aisles or gathering on the ovals to pray teachers shut the school down Kathy and I were talking about it this morning because I read a lot of books in revival and sometimes we forget, God, you actually moved amongst our network of churches in a similar way 31 years ago that over an extended period of time into Fiji 
into Papua New Guinea, into the Solomon Islands, into the, uh, the UK, where we started our movement of churches, the fire of God was burning and people were praying like never before. People were coming to Christ. I've got a diagram here, a circle diagram of how God brings about awakening in the nation. Renewal is when you and I are touched by God. Renewal happens when your heart and my heart, Alan spoke about our heart this morning, when our hearts get touched by the Spirit of God. And we live at a time right now, if there was ever a prophetic scripture for us, it's Hosea 10, 12, that we would break up the fallow ground of our hearts, that the church in Australia needs our heart plowed open again. We need our hearts to be renewed again. We need our love for God that when it comes time to worship, we don't have a coffee in one hand and a hand in the pocket in the, with the other hand. That, that, that we don't rock up 20 minutes late into worship with a yawn and a, you know, but we're coming with an expectant heart because our heart has come alive again. So every move of God starts with an individual renewal. And I believe we are right in that stage now where God is wanting to come and ignite your hearts. And if you are feeling a stirring, please don't go, well, that's just a little bit of enthusiasm. We're not talking about excitement or enthusiasm. We are talking about a God ignition in your spirit again that will bring something alive again. Ooh. <laughs> you look nervous then. It was like, oh, what's he going to do? When there's been an individual renewal, what happens then is that we have a corporate revival. It means a rise church corporately comes alive. And here's the beautiful thing about God. It doesn't take a lot of people to get a corporate revival. It doesn't take a lot of contagion to spread from a few people. Look at COVID, a few dirty virus carriers. And suddenly the world is infected. And the same thing with the Spirit of God. And so... A revival, when we hear that term revival, it's when a corporate, a community of faith like us here come alive in the presence of God. And then what happens, there's an awakening. An awakening is when the wider society is impacted. And that is our ultimate goal of you and I praying and believing God isn't for the four walls of the church to contain it. It's so that the whole uh, our district around this suburb around into Lismore, into Ballina, into all the other places around. Kathy and I live at Reserve Creek, right up to the, the, the Tweed Heads area, that the Spirit of God would pour out and touch hearts, that our high schools, our primary schools, our early learning centres, our universities, our workplaces, our homes, something would happen and people would come alive in the presence of God. That when people turn up for Blues Fest, I tell you what, they're going to have a, a God Fest on the way there or they're going to meet Christ there and we're going to see something something significant happen. A great uh, um, example of awakening is in 1904 and 05 in the Welsh revival, Wel Welsh awakening. Evan Roberts, they saw over 100,000 people come to Christ in that short period of time. And the results of that awakening were this. During the time of awakening, the police were left with virtually nothing to do and the courts were empty. Saloons or pubs and bars shut down for a lack of business. Could you imagine that in the main streets of Lismore? The publican waiting out, and if you're the publican here, I'm sorry, but this is our goal. Just standing there waiting to serve people and no one coming into the pub. Public drunkenness was almost non-existent. Old debts, many long forgotten, were paid off in full. Travelling theatrical agencies, or, or bands, just say, Blues Fest, cancelled their engagements because everyone was in church. Profanity disappeared. It was said that the horses and mules who worked in the coal mines everywhere were in complete confusion. They had become so accustomed to responding to their master's profanity, shouts and kicks and cursing, virtually now all that had disappeared. So that's what our goal is. But it's unlikely we will ever see an awakening without a personal renewal. So let me share with you this morning from 2 Chronicles chapter 34. Chronicles is in the Old Testament and we're going to dig into a story about a young king called Josiah. We've just dismissed the children next door. 
Well, Josiah was a king who became king at, at the age of eight. Josiah took the leadership when the nation of Judah was in radical decline, radical decline. People were in idolatry. People were, were worshipping false gods all through the lands. And this young king at eight begins to reign. Verse 1 says this, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of, his fa of David, his father. And he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. What's interesting about this is that his father was not David. His father was a guy called Amon. Amon was the king before him. And Amon was such a wicked king that he built idols to false gods everywhere. He was so hated as a king that Amon's own assistants or servants murdered him. His grandfather, Josiah's grandfather was Manasseh, who was just as evil as his father Amon was. And they worshipped false gods. And right throughout the land, they built altars and shrines. And on those altars and shrines, these, these, are the, these are the people who were leading God's people. These were the pastors of the day who were leading God's people. On the altars and the shrines, they would sacrifice their own children. I mean, this is the moral decline that Josiah was born into. Probably no different to us today in 2024. We may do it differently, but we still have shrines and idols built where we sacrifice people's lives on it. And then verses 3 to 5 say this, For in the eighth year of his reign, so this is when he was a teenager, while he was yet a boy, he began to seek the God of David his father, and in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places the asherim and the carved and metal images. And they chopped down the altars of Baal in his presence. And he cut down the incense altars that stood above them. And he broke in pieces the asherim and, carved the, the, and the carved metal images. And he made dust of them and scattered it over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. This guy was bad. He also burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. So at the age of eight, he becomes king. And then as a young teenager, he begins to purge the whole land from any form of worship that wasn't related to God. Not only that, he takes those, those images that had been built he grinds them to dust and he tips them on the graves of the priests who were meant to be representing God but were now representing Baal. He tips the, the, the dust and the bones of the priests that he grinds up, tips them over where, those old, old, the, the, where the previous altars had stood. I mean, Josiah came into the land to purge the land from all forms of ungodliness at a young age. And if anyone's in this room that's under the age of 25, can I encourage you, give God your younger years. The prayers you pray in this season will dictate the rest of your life. And the life that God has called you to is one of the most exciting lives, but it's not just for young people. For anyone here that's older, a study was done to find out the most productive age of a human being. Guess what the 10-year the decade of the most productiveness that you will ever have is? Guess what the age bracket is? When you are most productive, 60 to 70. Who's in that age bracket, 60 to 70? Come on, we want to see a bit more fruit from you. The second most productive is 70 to 80. Who would have thought? Because you have no longer anything to prove. You're secure in who you are. You can get about putting things into practice and not having to just worry about earning a living and trying to build your own followership on Instagram. The third 
most productive is 50 to 60. The average Nobel, Nobel Prize winner is 62. CEOs of prominent companies, the average age is 63. Of the 100 largest churches in the world, the average age of the pastor is 71. The average age of a pope is 76. I mean, the average age of an American president is like 120. <laughs> so this is not just a young person's game. So for every person from whatever age bracket you're in, Josiah called at eight years of age. But still for us who are in our 80s, God has still got a plan. And God still wants to put in you and I a passion to see an awakening in our nation. Amy Carmichael, got a photo of her famous missionary to India. Gave her life at a young age to go serve the orphans of India that she would rescue them from, the, the, from prostitution, from the shrines that had been erected to all the Hindu gods. 50 years of her life was spent there rescuing children. This was her prayer. Make my life thy fuel, O flame of God. Make my life thy fuel, O flame of God. What a prayer to pray. And I asked in this place this morning that there would be a group of us that would say, God, make my life thy fuel, O flame of God. So what did Josiah do that you and I can look at and go, well, this is where it starts. If we're going to see this great awakening through this nation, where does it start? Let me give you the five things in the next few moments we have that Josiah did. Number one is this. It says he sought God. When he became king, he began to seek God. Seeking God is the critical spark that brings the spirit engine to life. You know that we in the West are the first generation in 2,000 years to have lost the vision of the church as a house of prayer. You can go to most churches around Australia and around the world today and prayer will be pushed to the peripheral of the church. It'll be something that the women attend or a few of the older folk attend. But the people who should be attending as well don't attend because we see it as another thing we do. We have kids ministry, we have youth ministry, we have HR in a church, we have a communion service, we've got worship service oh, and we have prayer ministry. And yet prayer and seeking God is meant to be central to everything else we do. It should be the heart of who we are as a church. And even though preaching plays a significant part of what we do in ministry, the disciples never said to Jesus, hey, Jesus, teach us how to preach. The disciples never said to Jesus, hey, give us the top 10 leadership tips that you have. The one thing the disciples asked Jesus to show them, teach us how to pray. Because we've been with you three years and we still don't get this. And there is going to come a resurgence, mark my words on this, to churches who have got an ear to hear, a hunger and a discipline to pray. And I believe that one of the areas that God is going to increase is that the men, the Christian men, who often spend 90% of their life following their wife into church, are suddenly going to be out front with everyone else following them and saying, Dad, slow down. And Dad says, hey, I want to get there early. I want to get a good seat. I want to prepare my heart. That men, there will be a resurgence of men who want to know how to pray. Not just pray for an awakening, but pray for our families. A man that won't be afraid to sit on his child's bed and lay hands on his child and impart and to pray. And not leave that up to the wives to do. And truth being told, we have failed discipling our men to pray. But there's something about men who pray. It's like the revival in the Hebrides 
when the, uh, Duncan Campbell, the great revivalist, was preaching and it was a bit of a hard no- uh, night and people weren't responding and his preach wasn't working. And so they sent a message. This is what the message was. Send for the men of Barvis to come and pray. Barvis was a little community and what they were known for was having men who knew how to pray. Hey, the men of Barvis would come. <laughs> Imagine that, eh? Send for the men of Arise Church to pray. We've got an issue here. Send for the men of Arise to come and pray. Why not now? Why can't God do it now? Don't you think our nation is, is, is dark enough for God to come and show up now? It's not like we're living in the happiest time. And the only way to learn to persevere and to prayer is to burn every other bridge. Josiah at a young age began to seek God. The second thing he did is this. He went and tore down the strongholds. The strongholds represent the things in our life that we currently devote ourselves to. The next season of whatever that's coming out on Netflix or Paramount or whatever it might be, that we are just so excited about watching. Nothing wrong with watching it, but I'm amazed how easily that becomes what we get excited about. And yet opening up the Word of God is hard, hard work. So what is it right now that it's in your world that you find you spend a lot of your thought process dwelling upon? The next deal the next thing that's coming out, the next new thing. If you're like me, when I'm going to get something new, I research it. I, I, I find out everything about what I'm about to buy. But I get fixated on it. Kathy will say, I'd like, you know, we should think about buying this. And, you know, by that night, I'll have every option available for us. I get fixated on it. I want to be fixated like that on the things of God. And so Josiah goes through the land and he tears down the strongholds. So in our life, in our hearts, there are parts of our heart that we have handed over that used to belong to God. But now their parts are hard. And so what the call of Christ is that we would come back and offer those parts of our heart back to Him. Give that space back to God again and say, God, would you come and do it again in my heart? I know I've drifted. I know that I'm a little bit callous. I know I've chased after other things. So what have been the strongholds in your life? Listen, if if you've been struggling with an area for a week, two weeks, a month, several months, and it's been a struggle, chances are it's no longer a struggle. It's now a stronghold in your life. And you and I have got to get on the front foot with this stuff. Sometimes as Christians, we tolerate so much stuff in our life. My, my, my mother had three nervous breakdowns. Her mother before her tried to take her own life, hung, tried to hang herself because of a, a, a anxiety. And so when I had a burnout four years ago, it sent me, it, it took me to a very dark place, but it also made me to realise that in my family line that there is a, a, a propensity of weakness when it comes to, to being given over to the worry and the fear. And I didn't want to continue this cycle. So what did I do? I went and got some good therapy. I went disciplined and discipled myself in areas that I could grow in. I learned and discovered areas in my own life and in my family that I need to pray into to make sure that that curse doesn't continue on to our children and our children's children. So what is it? It's going into the land of our heart and grabbing those strongholds and thinking, man, I'm not going to repeat this. And Josiah goes out and pulls down every stronghold his father had erected. And so Josiah is saying, I'm not going to walk in the same steps my old man did. He may have been a drunkard. He may have left in an adulterous relationship. He may have left the family, but I'm not going to be like that. Went into the land and tore down the strongholds. And that's a call that's upon us as followers of Christ that we would do all we can, get counselling, get deliverance, get discipled, but get into the land of our heart and tear down the strongholds. 
Number three is this. What did he do? Thirdly, I've got a lot of spit coming. My iPad is covered in spit right now. <laughs> Get some disinfectant on that. The third thing he did was this. He got the presence of God back. 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verse 8. Now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had cleansed the land and the house, he sent big name Steve-O and the son of Azo and Mazza, the governor of the city, and Joaz and son of Josh and the, record, the recorder to repair the house of the Lord his God. So he cleanses the land of all the idolatry, seeks God, and then they go to the house of God and they begin to put things back in order again. It had fallen into disrepair. So Josiah gets all the guys, he gets all the tradies together, he goes, right oh, I've got a plan. You know the house of God? It's the, it's the haunted place down the road that everyone kind of gets freaked out by. It's got broken shutters and cobwebs everywhere and the grass is overgrown. We're going to get it back. We're going we're to make right the house of God again. So he puts the people to work to prepare the house of God to capture the presence of God. We live at a time when we have got more means to reach people. We've got better buildings, more mega churches than ever before. But we also live in the greatest spiritual decline in history. 25 years ago, you could count the mega churches around the world on two hands. Today, there are tens of thousands of them. We've got more celebrity pastors than ever before, more podcasts going out, more books being written, but the world is still getting darker. Something is missing. I love what Duncan Campbell from the Hebrides Revival said. He said this, Revival is not churches filled with people, but people filled with God. Yeah. Folks, what a tragedy if people come to a rise church looking for God and they only ever find us. There is right now, a nudging of the Holy Spirit for us to be a people that will contend for the presence of God. Not just in a church service, but in our personal life. That we would carve out time each day to seek God and allow the presence of God, the person of Jesus, the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Ghost to come and to minister to our hearts that wherever we go in your, in your career, you go as a teacher into a school, you carry a presence of God about you that makes you different from everyone else, enables you to handle the problems that are coming your way. And unfortunately, the church has been people-driven, not presence-driven. And the truth is, people count, but God weighs. So, uh, uh, Proverbs 21.2 says this, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. And there is, right around the world, a, 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 fire, a spark that's beginning to bring to life the dry kindling of people hungry for God's presence again. I come from the era in the 80s and the early 90s where that was abused. And we thought the presence of God meant longer church meetings. And the longer the church meeting went, that was a sign. So we thought that the presence of God was there. But it wasn't. It was just people being religious. We're not talking about a formula here. We're talking about when it comes time to the house of God, that your presence and our temple, God, that your presence is what we need. Because we do so much of life with a dry, parched heart. So Josiah sends the boys in to rebuild the house. Number four, and the musos can come on up. That's not number four, but <laughs> make the Word of God central. Have a look at this. In verse, 2 Chronicles 34, verse 14. While they were bringing out the money that had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given through Moses. And Steve-O read it before the king. And when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. So, so get this. They're in repairing the house of God. 
They've cut all the shrubs back. They've got all the cobwebs out. They've moved all the stuff from people hoarding in it out and cleaned it all up. And beneath a pile of dusty old books, they find what scholars believe the original manuscripts of the book of Deuteronomy, written by Moses. No small thing to find. Wouldn't you love to find that in a garage sale? The original book of Deuteronomy, just sitting there, covered in dust. They bring it to Josiah, they begin to read it, and he doesn't go, oh yeah, sounds good. The Bible says he is so moved, he tears his clothes in grief because for the first time he hears what Israel should be doing, what Judah should be doing and isn't doing. They were meant to be having a Passover feast every year, but they had stopped doing it for so long. They were meant to be in a covenant relationship with God, but because there was no Scripture to refer to, they had drifted. And Josiah finds it, hears it, and doesn't go, well, that's fantastic. I'll put that on a podcast sometime. You know, that's, that's awesome news. Josiah institutes through the whole land, everyone, we've got to get back into covenant with our God. We've drifted. He institutes the Passover, which some scholars say hadn't been celebrated correctly for 400 years. Josiah comes in and brings reform into the nation to get the nation back in line with God. Why? All because he rediscovered the centrality of God's Word. Both sin and busyness have this exact same effect. They cut us off from connection to God, to other people and even to our own soul, which is why we need a daily interaction with the Word of God. You know, the average person can read between 200 and 400 words per minute. I know you guys here are above average, so that's even more than that. At that speed, you would read 200 books a year. It's not bad. However, the average Aussie spends over 850 hours a year scrolling Instagram. Almost 3,000 hours a year watching TV. Whereas if you just dedicated one hour a day, you would read the whole Bible cover to cover, including the maps, in six months. So time's not our issue. It's devotion is our issue. And Josiah, after rediscovering the Word of God, says, come on, let's make this central to who we are again. And let's get our lives back around it. William Tyndale. He was around in the 18, uh, 1490s to early 1500s. He was the first translator of the Greek Bible, into, uh, the Greek New Testament into English. And up until this time, up until Tyndale came, the Roman Catholic Church had a monopoly on the Bible. They would not allow people like you and I to read Scripture because they were afraid that if you understood what was in the Word of God, you would realise that you don't need to pay money to get pay for your family to get released from purgatory and they would lose the riches of the Catholic Church. So they kept the Bible away from common people. Tyndale, with a fire in his heart, gave his life so that people like you and I could get Scripture in our hand. For 11 years, the Catholic Church pursued him, trying to kill him. Finally, when he does translate the first copy in 1536, he is betrayed by a good friend imprisoned for 16 months, strangled and burnt at the stake. They say that the last words of William Tyndale as the flames shot up his body were this, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Because he was siding with the Catholic Church, the King of England. Two years later, 1538, the last prayer of William Tyndale was answered 
when King Henry gave a royal decree that an English Bible will be placed in every parish church throughout the whole of England. Here's what I want to say. People gave their life so you and I can have a Bible we can read. And this is not a guilt trip, please. But oftentimes for us, it's, it's so hard to even open. It sits on a shelf if we even know where it is sitting. And yet men and women over hundreds and hundreds of years have given their life because of their firm belief that our whole life should be oriented around the Word of God. And God is bringing His church back to understanding the necessity for the Word of God. And number five, lastly, is this. Josiah, all of this, these last four things treed up to this one thing. He had a responsive heart. Second Chronicles 34 verse 26 says, Tell the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the words heard. Because your heart, Josiah, was responsive, and you humbled yourself before God when you heard what He spoke against this place and its people. And because you humbled yourself before me and tore your clothes, uh, your robes and wept in my presence, I have heard you, declares the Lord. His heart. He sought God. He dealt with the idols in his own heart, the strongholds. He hungered after the presence of God. He got his life oriented around the Word of God. What did it create? It created a responsive heart. If we want nations to shake at God's Word, it's got to start with us and our heart trembling at God's Word. Founder of the Salvation Army, William Booth. I love this. He said this, Not called, did I hear you say? Not heard the call, I think you should say. <laughs> what was he talking about? A lack of a responsive heart. Last quote, Frank Bartleman, who was a part of the Azusa Street Revival in the early 1900s said this, the depth of any revival will be determined exactly by the spirit of repentance that is obtained. In fact, this is the key to every true revival born of God. It never, God never needs a lot of people to get things going. He just needs a few hungry people yeah. that say, God, I, I, don't, I don't want to spend. And this has been my prayer. I don't want to spend the next 20 years of my life going through the motions as a Christian. No I don't want to run a church where, I'm looking at you now, Al. Mm. <laughs> He's deep in meditation. Is You've got a pastor who actually... Worships. I don't know about you, but I don't want to run a church where I'm looking for the next thing just to get people here. No. That we've got to have a cake <laughs> or burgers. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. And hopefully people will come for the cake and the burgers. Nothing wrong with it. But can you imagine a day, and why not now, that there is a people that say, cake or burgers or not, I'm after God. I need God. My family needs God. We need the presence of God, the Word of God. I want the spark of the Holy Spirit to bring the engine of my heart alive again. Let me tell you, that will win a city. Yeah. You will have parking problems here, seating problems here. You'll have lineups of 30 people and the ladies. <laughs> we'll need to build more toilets. Because ultimately, we have tried everything else to win a generation and it's not working. So how about we try surrendered hearts to Christ and we come back to that place of hunger and say, God, why not now? Let's pray. Father, and I believe that this is the heart of your pastors. And Alan and Jackie, I want to encourage you that even amongst all the busyness of pastoring and working and family and everything that's going on, I know deep 
beneath all of that, there is a yearning for God to come and do something. And sometimes it's buried beneath all of the, 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 the stuff, the rubble of life. And I really feel in the next short season that God is going to get you to rummage through the rubble again and allow that, that hunger and allow that expression to begin to make its way to the surface. I see a fresh bubbling that's being released in your spirit. Like it's the water beginning to, to, to flow up out of the well of your spirit. And not everyone's going to like it. But let me tell you that there is a generation of people who are thirsty, who are thirsty. And I even see in your preaching, something's going to shift. God is going to allow you to have faith for a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So Father, I pray over this community of faith this morning, over every heart in this place, Lord, why not now? Why not start it in us as individuals, a renewal of our love for You and a responsive heart? Just while eyes are closed, let me ask this morning, maybe you've never surrendered your heart to Jesus. That's where it all starts. That's, that's the greatest act of renewal, of our heart being made new. It's such a radical time that Jesus actually said it's like being born again. It's like becoming a whole new person. And maybe you know about religion and maybe you've attended a Christian school or you've gone to a certain church, but you yourself have never had a relationship with a God who loves you intimately then this morning, we'd love the opportunity to pray with you so that you can begin that relationship. And while eyes are closed, if that's you and you say, hey, Ross, I, I, I want to know God in that way. I want to start that relationship with Jesus Christ. While eyes are closed, I'd love you just to slip your hand up in the air and go, that to me. That, thank you so much. You can put it down. Thank you so much. You can put it down. Who else here this morning? You just go, yeah, that's me. Thank you. Up the back there, you can put it down. You just want to say, hey, that's me this morning. I need that in my life. Last time as I look across. Awesome. Can we stand together then? Let's all stand up. And I, I'd love us all to pray this prayer together. And especially for those few people that put their hand up. It's simply a prayer of surrender. And you know where your heart is at this morning with God, whether it's distant or whether it's close, whether it's disconnected or whether there's connection. But simply by praying this prayer again, allows our heart to say, hey God, here I am. So would you repeat these words, all of us together, just after me, say these, things, these words, Jesus this morning, Jesus this morning. I give you my heart. Every part, of it. Every part of it. Come and fill me. Come and fill me. With your love. With your love. And change me. Change me. Into the person you want me to be. The person that you want me to be. In Jesus' name. I'm going to um, hand back to Al, but this is what I'd love to do after he dismisses and does whatever he does. I want to spend some time and I want to pray for you. If you say this morning, hey Ross, my, my heart, I, my seeking God is, is minuscule. My hunger for God is almost gone. I want the spark to come and bring it to life again. I'm going to be up the front. I'll pray for you. I'm not going to take long it won't be reciting Deuteronomy over you just going to pray for you and believe for an impartation that something can come alive in your heart this morning amen thanks Al